Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the first session of the Global Food Banking Network's Virtual Food Bank Leadership Institute. Um, as many of you know, I am Lisa Moon, and I am fortunate to lead GFN. So this is the first of a series of sessions we are going to be convening virtually over the next six months. Um, it's a really critical time for the world and the cause of hunger. Um, as many of you know, we had hoped to be together in Mexico City in September. Uh, and Banco de Alimentos Mexico had done a tremendous amount to prepare for the event. And we will look forward to getting together when it is safe to do so. Uh, today's session will focus on law and policy solutions for greater food donation. Uh, this has always been a critical topic, especially for food banks. Um, but now with such high unemployment rates and an estimated one in two people without social protection globally, it is more important than ever that wholesome edible food be made available to fight hunger instead of being thrown away. We are very excited to have attendees from over, over 40 countries joining us. I especially want to welcome the food bank leaders that are with us. Um, I know that many of you have been working tirelessly seven days a week, some in 24 hours a day. Thank you for your hard work and dedication during these very difficult times. So slides are available when you enter the session in both English and Spanish. Uh, links to the Global Food Donation Atlas, which our speakers will be discussing, are made available on the event's website. The session is being recorded and it is considered on the record. So to begin today's program, I'm going to hand it over to Doug O'Brien, GFN's Vice President of Programs. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome everyone. GFN has set forth a research and policy agenda to inform and offer greater awareness of the scope and impact food banks are having around the world to feed the hungry, strengthen our communities, and prevent food loss and waste through food recovery efforts. Food banks are a civil society response to urgent community needs. Food banks are not a replacement to government action or responsibility to care for the most vulnerable in our societies. But where social protections are insufficient or non-existent, food banks serve an essential role to feed the hungry and advocate for improved food access and better social protections. Today, the GFN network spans 44 countries from every global region and from nations of varying socioeconomic and cultural contexts. Through national and local networks, food banks are providing food assistance to nearly 17 million people in need and many millions more in response to the COVID-19 emergency. Last year, the network recovered more than 800 million kilos of food. That's the equivalent of 1.4 billion meals, but much more can be recovered. Too much safe, quality, surplus food is needlessly wasted while still too many people go hungry. Food banks, empowered with the knowledge research provides, can inform and advocate for strengthened policies to improve our food systems reduce food insecurity in our communities, and better protect our environment. Differing or insufficient national laws on food donation can frustrate these goals through liability or tax barriers or vague or inconsistent regulations, which too often prevent the donation of food. Where policies are strong, we can learn from each other, sharing knowledge across borders and national contexts to better promote food recovery and better food access. To address these challenges and opportunities, GFN sought the collaboration of the leading institution in this field, Harvard Law School's Food Law and Policy Clinic. This partnership has led to the creation of groundbreaking new research, which we'll discuss today. It's the Global Food Donation Policy Atlas, a project assessing the legal and policy frameworks around food donation and offering country by country recommendations to strengthen those policies. The Global Food Donation Policy Atlas is accessible through an online platform and includes a special COVID-19 supplement on ways government can improve food access in pandemic response. The Atlas is available through GFN's website at www.foodbanking.org. It is now my honor to introduce our first keynote speakers to the virtual FBLI series, a pair of experts who led and authored this groundbreaking research. First will be Emily Broadlieb, Clinical Professor of Law and Director of Harvard Law School's Food Law and Policy Clinic. Emily will share the project's scope and year one findings with a look to the future of this project. She will be followed by her colleague, Melissa Shapiro, 
clinical instructor of Harvard Law School's Food Law and Policy Clinic. And Melissa will speak to the key issues and policy challenges food banks have faced in the COVID-19 emergency and best practices governments may consider for greater food access in the pandemic response now and in the recovery. Following the presentations, there'll be a period of question and answer. Please forward your Q&As to the box on your screen. With well over 200 participants from around the world, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So without any further delay, let me welcome Emily Broadley, Director of the Food Law and Policy Clinic. Emily, over to you. Uh, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for that welcome, Doug. And I want to echo Doug and Lisa in just um, regretting that we're not all able to be in person, but I'm also really grateful to be able to join you today. Um, so as you'll see uh, here, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about our project. Um, just to give some background, as Doug mentioned, I direct the Food Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School, which is a service learning program at Harvard Law School where we um, offer uh, direct service to um, businesses, NGOs, and governments on a variety of food law and policy issues while educating and engaging law students in learning about these areas and learning how to be advocates in this space um, in the future. Uh, we focus on four different areas across health, production, sustainability, and most notably on reducing food waste. So before I get started and go through our atlas, I want to start by, by saying a big thank you to a couple folks. First, I want to thank um, GFN for being such an amazing partner on our work these past few years. Um, as Doug mentioned, we first connected with GFN about two years ago uh, because they were looking for someone to help in analyzing and comparing the laws on food donation across countries. Um, and we had some expertise on doing this on laws on food waste in the US, which made this a really great partnership. Um, I also want to thank the many GFN affiliates and stakeholders that we work with in country. So I'll talk about the ones we work with so far in year one, and we've already started with some of the other countries in our research. And we've just been amazed um, at every step of the way at how much hospitality, support, um, painstaking review our country partners have done. And I can't express enough my gratitude for that. I want to thank the Food Law and Policy Clinic team, which includes my colleague Melissa, who you'll hear from shortly, and also Ariel Ardora and Kira Sanborn. And also more than 20 students over the past two years who have worked on our Atlas research. Um, and I especially want to thank Regan Fleekenpole, Amanda Dell, and Emily Eastlas, who helped prepare my slides for today. And last but not least, I want to thank the Walmart Foundation and in particular Eileen Hyde for supporting this project and helping us to develop the proposal, supporting us through the challenging times this year in figuring out how to do this launch and how to get everything out into the world. Um, this has been an amazing project and I'm just grateful that we have the opportunity to work on it and to work with such amazing partners. So today I'm going to go through uh, the Atlas project. I'll tell you a little bit about um, what we did and our methodology. And then I'll do a little walkthrough of the online platform so I can explain how you can use it and where to find materials. Um, but then I'll go through in a little bit of detail some of the findings from the first five countries that we researched in year one and that are all available on the website. And those are the US, Canada, Mexico, India, and Argentina. And then I'll mention briefly where we're going to go next, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Melissa to talk about um, the findings that we had on ways to strengthen food donation during COVID-19. So what's the issue that we're looking at here? I know I'm speaking to the choir for many of you, but um, an estimated 1.3 billion tons of food is lost or wasted globally each year. So this is about a third of the food supply. Um, this is, um, differs from country to country in terms of where in the food supply that food is lost and wasted, but it occurs virtually in every part of the globe. Um, in some of the countries we looked at for year one, we saw in the U.S., it's about 62.5 million tons of food wasted per year. Mexico, it's about 20 million tons. In India, um, estimates put it at 40% of all of the food produced. And this is just the 1.3 billion tons is prior to COVID-19, and we don't have good data on what that looks like now, but we can only imagine that it's increased because of things like 
supply chain shutdowns in the hospitality and restaurant sectors, um, export and import restrictions, worker illnesses or density reductions in order to keep workers safe that have had slowdowns in processing and harvesting. Um, so I think we can imagine that this number will have gone up at the end of this crisis. At the same time that all of that food is wasted, more than 820 million people suffer from hunger, according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And the FAO estimates that this may double due to COVID-19. In the US alone, there are estimates that food insecurity may have tripled from about 11% last year to as high as 38% now. Um, in Argentina, for example, 32% of the population was in poverty prior to COVID-19, and 11% were severely food insecure. In India, a staggering 40% of the population is undernourished. Um, so again, we have these dual challenges of food waste and people in hunger that exist, coexist at the same time. So why is all of this food wasted despite the need and despite the opportunities to make sure that it gets to people who are, who are in need of food? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that we focused on is that government, through its laws and policies, plays a key role. Um, one of the challenges is that there's confusion over the laws that regulate food and their application to food donation. So often food donation is not even mentioned in laws which means that there's a lot of questions and each business um, and each food bank is trying to figure out what is allowed to be done. Sometimes there's barriers in laws to, um, to donations, such as requirements that can't be met or added costs that don't make sense economically. Sometimes it's because there's a lack of incentives for food donation, which means that it's very difficult for businesses to make a commitment to donate day in and day out because there's really no incentive to do that. So our critical solution that we're looking at in our research is adopt clear and comprehensive laws and regulations for food donations. While this seems simple, what we've seen is that very few countries have legal frameworks that directly address or effectively support food recovery and donations. But what we found through our research is that each country has different strengths and weaknesses. And our work has been to pull those out and analyze them and show those opportunities. So over the past two years, we teamed up with GFN to do just that. As I mentioned, GFN approached us to ask for help in analyzing and comparing the laws um, to find the key issues and best practices. We have extensive experience at looking at food waste policy in the US. We've worked on supporting businesses and NGOs, including those with new and innovative models in understanding and improving the laws. In the US, we also have experience in achieving policy change at the local, state, and federal level. And then we also have had experience with comparing laws on food recovery and food waste across states in the US. So we put all of this to work in our Global Food Donation Policy Atlas. Um, so we work, first worked to identify and analyze national laws on food donation and the most common legal barriers in our 15 countries. So today I'll talk about the first five, um, but we'll continue from there. Um, then we work to create the following deliverables. For each country, we created a legal guide which provides an overview of the frameworks relevant to food donation in that country. Um, and we made this separate because what we found in our work here in the US is that often governments are really looking for, they're getting a lot more questions about food donation and are looking for information that they can share. And so in the US, sometimes state and federal governments have actually provided links to our guidance documents as a statement of what the law is. So the legal guide for each country. For each country, there's a um, report which includes policy recommendations and highlights opportunities to fill some of the gaps and break down some of the barriers in that country. Each country also has an executive summary that synthesizes the major findings. And these are a good starting place for um, those who are coming from other countries and trying to understand the framework um, you know, to get a quick snapshot. And then we have an interactive map that easily compares policies across countries. And I'll spend most of my time today going through some of the aspects of that map to share with you our comparative findings. I wanna talk a little bit about our methodology because I think that it's really important to us and based on the work that we've done here to talk about how we're making, how we're identifying the laws and understanding them and especially how we're understanding the, the recommendations that we need to make. So first, we selected countries with input from GFN, 
we focused there on um, countries where there were facing legal questions or in some cases countries that had just passed a really exciting and innovative law that we could help to analyze and share with other countries. We, and a very important step of this was that we connected with the food bank organization in each country to just confirm and make sure that they had the time and capacity and interest to partner with us. So we weren't parachuting in anywhere without having that partnership with um, the food bank network or networks within that country that, uh, that work with GFN. And then we conducted very extensive legal and policy research on the laws in each country. We looked at articles, we looked at primary sources of law, we looked at global resources. Um, we then were able to visit every country and interview stakeholders. Um, this will be challenging in the coming months, but it is something that we'll still continue to do virtually. And for us, this means not only spending a lot of time with the food bank network, but also speaking with food donors, such as retailers, hotels, restaurants, um, colleges and universities, uh, government agencies, including um, ministries of food safety, of agriculture, of social welfare, um, talking to other NGOs, really getting some perspectives on where the barriers exist and on what's working well. We then put all of that together to write the guides and to create recommendations. And lastly, we consulted with the in-country, both legal experts. So in each country, we made sure that someone reviewed the legal guide to ensure its accuracy with regard to the country laws. And then of course, with the uh, food bank partners to make sure that um, all, everything resonated with their experience and their understanding, and also that the recommendations were really the top priorities. Um, and you'll see that the recommendations vary to some extent across countries. Even if we're looking at the same areas, the recommendation might be slightly different based on local needs and interests. Um, so I just wanna take a minute to acknowledge the in-country partners. There's a couple pictures here and you'll see some others throughout. On the left, you can see that our team meeting with folks at Daily Bread in Toronto in November of 2019. Um, Daily Bread is one of the agencies of Food Banks Canada, which was our partner in Canada. And on the right, uh, you'll see our team visiting the La Plata Food Bank in the province of Buenos Aires, in Argentina, last year. And we have also Natasha Hinch, who's um, from La Red, uh, which was our partner in Argentina. And I want to acknowledge our other country partners in the U.S. We work with Feeding America in Mexico with Bamex, who we had hoped we get to see again, but hopefully we will all be there soon. And in India with Zomato Feeding India, as well as with the Bangalore Food Bank and India Food Banking Network. Um, and again, I, I can't thank enough our partners for all the time and expertise they shared with us, hosting us on trips um, and helping us connect with the resources that we needed. So I want to spend some time here on really what our findings were in the areas. Um, so based on our years of food waste research in the U.S., we knew what some of these issues were even going into this project. But the surprise to me was that despite the different legal contexts, the different reasons that food is lost and wasted, and the very different models of the food bank networks within each country, the same key legal issues emerged in virtually every country. Some of these were issues that we knew about and have analyzed for years in the US, and others were new. So um, for example, tax barriers is something that, we, that was not an issue in our work in the US and we had to learn about. And also including government grants and incentives as a key area was something that really came from our partners and our discussion. Um, each brief um, and our maps include all of these areas. The briefs, the, the legal guides for each country also include a miscellaneous section that covers other laws that might be specific to that country. But these are really the core areas. And I want to stress that for those of you listening today that are trying to figure out um, how to craft better policies in your country, how to talk with your policymakers, um, really these are the key areas that I think are the places to start that conversation. So food safety, as an example, food safety laws, one of the challenges here is that they often don't mention donation, which means that businesses, food banks, and even regulators, every decision that they make, they're making in the absence of clear guidance as to whether donation is allowed and then how it should be done. Date labeling is another area. Most date labels on food products, such as Best Buy or Use Buy, 
most of those are related to quality of that product. But what we found is that the large majority of consumers and businesses think that the labels are related to safety and therefore uh, are hesitant to or even barred from donating food past the date, even for shelf stable products. Um, liability protection, this is an area in the US and food industry report found that 50% of businesses don't donate because of fears of liability, meaning that if the food is donated and someone eventually gets sick, uh, that there would be um, a lawsuit where the business would have to defend itself in court. Uh, so this is a growing area of countries looking at offering protection against that liability for food donors that don't that handle the food appropriately and safely. On the tax section, we have both incentives and barriers. Um, food donation is not free. It costs a lot for businesses to store the food, transport it, um, train their staff on how to properly uh, manage food for donation. And it's hard to make it a habit if there's no incentive for businesses to do that. And then tax barriers, which I mentioned was new for us, uh, but it's an issue in many, many countries, especially countries that have a value added tax or a VAT tax. Um, as an example, across the EU, there's a European Council directive that says that donation is considered a taxable event, um, even if the food's donated for free. So unless countries make a modification, they must pay a tax when the food is donated, even for free. And then requirements and penalties, these are new, kind of one of the newer areas of law, policies that penalize companies for either throwing food away or for failing to donate safe edible food. Um, this is, uh, again, a newer area, but one that we're seeing more interest in and more development, particularly at the provincial and state level. And then lastly, government grants and incentives. Um, and again, this was an area that was new for us, um, but came up in a lot of our discussions, particularly in countries where there's a lot of food wasted post-harvest and infrastructure is really needed to make sure that food is, both makes it to market, but then if that food is unsafe, that it can be donated. And here's the end result. Here are some of our beautiful deliverables. Uh, on the left is the screenshot of the Atlas, which I'm gonna go through in more detail. And on the right, you can see just one of our many reports. Um, happy we're profiling Argentina because that was our first country. So this is the legal guide for Argentina. So I'm now gonna show a little video run through of the website so you can see how it works and what there is available. Here's the home page. And scrolling down, you can click right from the home page directly into the Atlas, view the Atlas. Um, and here, once you're within the Atlas, along the left side, you'll see each of the legal issues that I just mentioned. And when you click, countries light up in different colors. Um, red is no policy, yellow is a weak policy, and green is a strong policy. Um, and then just if you click on, one of the policies, you can scroll over each country to see a little more detail on why we categorized it as being strong or weak or no policy, as you can see here. And then you can click on any country, like here on India, to pull up that country. And then once in there, you can scroll between the legal areas or click on them at the bottom to see any of the areas of law. And, and it summarizes that country's policy. And then on each page, you can download those executive summary, legal guide, and recommendations. The bottom of the atlas, you can see a little more about our methodology. So this is what I just described, um, just with a little bit more detail about the steps that we took in conducting our research. And in the library is where you can access the guides and recommendations and summary for every country, as well as multiple languages, hopefully forthcoming very shortly. Um, we just got the Spanish and French translations, and then at the bottom are other issue briefs. Um, so we added this COVID-19 page. You'll hear more about our work on this area from Melissa shortly. And then just the About Us page, which lower down also goes through the legal areas. And lastly, how you can contact us. You can submit questions directly um, and also contact us from the bottom. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through, so you, I know that video, which was excellent, I'm grateful to my uh, interns for putting it together. Um, you can hear, see a little bit more on each of the areas, and I'm briefly gonna share a couple findings from those. 
So for food safety, as I mentioned, a key barrier to donation of surplus food is the lack of knowledge or guidance regarding safe procedures for food donation. For this area, we found that only two countries had a relevant policy, and those were Mexico and India. Um, a note on how you can use the color coding. So I put up here on the right side a little more information about what the color coding means. Um, by learning more about the laws in each country, starting to compare them and really hear from on the ground experiences with different stakeholders, we were able to really develop metrics for what were strong, weak policies and no policy. Um, but as you can imagine, for food safety, for example, no policy doesn't mean that there's no food safety law. There are food safety laws on the books in every country. What it means is that there's no policy that mentions food donation anywhere in the food safety laws. So there's no place that a food business could go into food safety laws and understand what they need to do in order to do safely donate food. Um, and here we, we categorize both Mexico and India as a weak instead of strong policy because we found that while there is now a regulation on the books, there still were some outstanding questions about how it intersected with all the other areas of food safety regulation. So color coding can really be helpful to those both in the countries that we're studying, but also in other countries to be able to choose an area and then see who has a policy on that area and then be able to go deeper in that guide or recommendations where we, within those, we have citations that go to every area of law so that you can actually pull those up and understand. So I want to, for this area, give a shout out and a spotlight on India because we were really impressed with the work there um, in 2019, driven in large part by our country partners such as Zomato Feeding India. The, Indian, uh, the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India introduced surplus food regulations or um, formally the regulations, regulations for the recovery and distribution of surplus food. Um, and these set out standards relevant to leftover food that may be donated. So first, we were just so impressed. This was the first country that really we saw a food safety agency taking a stand to say that they thought food donation was part of their mission, was critical to the work that they were doing. And I think that that's really something that can be mirrored in other countries. And some of the strengths of this law were that it says donation is allowed. There were questions before this whether donation was even an allowable practice. And this really obviously says there's there's law behind this, the agency is behind it. Excess surplus food that's safe should be donated. It then sets out some of the requirements as to how that should be donated, both on the business side and then on the food recovery organization side. And then because India is such a large country, even though food safety is regulated at the national level, implementation is done by the states. So it sets out that each state should set up monitoring committees to really look at um, uh, the practices of food recovery organizations and businesses within those states. We did have some recommendations of what next steps could be. Um, one area here was that there's still some question about what areas in the general uh, Food Safety and Standards Act apply to food donations. So that was an area where as this regulation moves forward, more work could be done on that. All right, so liability protection is another area. This is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, food businesses often are worried that if they donate, they might wind up in court if someone gets sick. Even if they handle the food safely, they don't know what will happen once it's in the hands of the food bank or the end consumer, uh, and they just don't want to take that risk. Um, so uh, I want to note that we have not seen lawsuits on this. Um, as much as there's a fear of, protect of liability, this isn't something that we're seeing people being called into court. But for the largest companies, they don't want to take any risk for food that they're not making any money from the sale of. So what we found is two countries have liability protection um, at the national level. Those are the US and Argentina. I'll flag Canada, which has provincial level liability protection in all of the provinces, but we still didn't count it as having a liability protection law because there's no national statement that says um, food donors are protected, which makes for some challenges with businesses that are donating across provinces. Um, just to spotlight the two countries that we have researched so far that had a national level of liability protection, those are the U.S. and Argentina. In the U.S., the protection has been on the books since 1996, and it provides comprehensive liability protection against both civil and criminal lawsuits for food donors and nonprofits. 
that receive and distribute that food unless they act with gross negligence or malicious intent. So as long as the food is being handled safely, being passed off safely at each level, that protection will apply. For Argentina, um, a shout out here to La Red for this success, which was um, working with the Argentine government to amend the food donation law in 2018 in order to add a clause that provides liability protection, which was in Article 9. Um, and this extends to both food donors and food recovery organizations that receive and equitably distribute free donations of food to those in need. The food needs to meet all the food safety laws, but good faith or buena fe is presumed so that the burden of proof is on the party that's alleging um, the wrongdoing. And the burden of proof is not on the donor or the food recovery organization. It's presumed that they were acting in good faith. Um, but I'll note that this is an area that uh, Argentina, as you can see, passed this in 2018. We're seeing a lot more countries passing these laws or examining them um, in the recent years. On tax, um, there's, uh, this is a two-sided coin, as I mentioned. There's both opportunities for incentives and then also issues with barriers. Um, food donation can be expensive as food donors have to allocate time and money to recover, package, store, and transport surplus food. So uh, we saw that actually across four of the five countries um, that we examined, they have a tax incentive on the books, but some are stronger than others. We put the US in the category of having a strong tax incentive. Um, the US offers both a general deduction for donations and a special enhanced deduction for donation of food um, that provides almost uh, up to two times the basis value or the cost of acquiring that food and with a cap of up to 15 percent of taxable income of the business some of the countries we said were weak because while the, the benefit is great there's a lower cap so for mexico it's capped at seven percent of the donor's taxable income and in argentina at five percent so it's it limits the amount of this tax benefit that can be claimed um, I have a pop-out box here to mention tax barriers. Um, so in some countries, as I spoke about before, there can be a tax barrier through the application of the value-added tax. Um, so in our research, this was an issue that came up in Argentina. Um, so the donation of food is not considered a tax taxable event in Argentina. However, when businesses in Argentina have to throw food away, they are able to claim a credit from the government for the cost of the tax that they paid when they were acquiring it from the previous business in the chain. But if food is don donated for free to a food bank or nonprofit, businesses can't claim that same credit for the tax that they paid. Um, and we spoke to one business in Argentina that said that this cost them $1.2 million in lost credit in one year just by donating food instead of throwing it away and therefore being barred from claiming that credit from the government. So I'm gonna be much quicker on these few. Those were the ones I thought were really interesting to pull out. Um, on date labeling, as I said, there's some a general misconception about date labels, such as sell by, use by, or best by. For the vast majority of foods, these labels really indicate freshness and not safety. Um, what we found was that no country had a strong date label policy, and actually the US has no policy and no law that regulates date labels at all. In the other countries, the reason we found the policies were weak rather than strong was primarily because even if they required um, some date labels on food products, they didn't do a good job of distinguishing between labels for safety or quality or making it clear that foods that had a date label that was really just about freshness or quality could be safely donated afterwards. For donation requirements, this uh, means either penalties to companies for wasting food or not donating, or requirements that they donate. So for example, in the US, we've seen this at some of the state level. Here in Massachusetts, where I live, we have a penalty for businesses that throw away more than one ton of food per week. Um, so these are really the biggest businesses, but that's an example of this. Um, it's a really new area of law, but it's growing quickly and has the opportunity to really be transformative because it really treats food as an asset and as a resource that should be either donated or recovered and not go to landfill. 
because no country so far in our research has this at the national level, we counted as a weak policy the three countries where we saw this proliferating at the state or provincial level. Um, but I will note that in our next round of research, we will be including France, which has a national law that requires donation of surplus food for stores that are larger than 400 square meters. So that will be in our future research. And then the last area was government grants and incentives. Uh, federal or local grant and incentive programs can be a really important resource for food donation initiatives, um, especially as an alternative or supplement to any sort of tax incentive. Um, we found that three of the five countries that we examined so far have some program with that provides grants or incentives, either grants directly to food banks to get vehicles or build um, storage capacity or grants to businesses to invest in some of these needed um, equipment. Uh, we found the U.S. was strong. The reason we put U.S. in the strong category was that uh, in addition to some one-time grants or competitive grants, there are at the federal level and in several states ongoing annual appropriations that provide funds or food to food banks. Um, by contrast, Canada and Argentina had some different grants that were really great investments, but were not um, necessarily ongoing investments in uh, food recovery and donation. So as you can see, I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully this provides you with some starting point of our findings and of these key areas of law and a little bit of input as to how you can use the Atlas to actually click through and find out what are strong policies or weak policies and then know what research to dig into within each country in order to understand more. And so briefly, our future of the Atlas, uh, we have 10 countries that will be coming up in the next year. Some of these, we've already done the research and we'll be publishing those documents this fall. And for some of them, we're just getting started and we're eager to meet new partners and, and you know, learn more and be able to share um, both the successes and opportunities as well for those countries. Um, and then we'll be also thinking about other areas for issue briefs. So you'll hear in a moment from my colleague, Melissa, about our research on COVID-19 and food donation. But as we find these thematic areas where we can pull out information to be really useful across countries, we'll be publishing some other issue briefs on those. So lastly, thanks again uh, to all of our partners and especially to Walmart Foundation. Um, here's a lot of information about how to find the Atlas, which is at atlas.foodbanking.org and different ways to connect with us. And with that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to Melissa to talk about COVID-19 and food donation. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> so that was an excellent overview of the Atlas project and preview of the outputs that we've developed thus far and what's ahead. Um, I am pleased to be speaking to you all today about an issue brief that we developed as part of the Atlas project. Um, and it is on strengthening food donation operations during COVID-19, identifying key issues and best practices for governments around the globe. Uh, now, this project was uh, conceived a few years ago, so the ongoing pandemic was not part of the initial project vision. Uh, food donation operations are critical to the global fight against food loss, waste, and hunger, not just during a pandemic, but under all circumstances. That being said, the impact of COVID-19 has been unprecedented. Uh, after all, if not for the pandemic, we would have presented the Atlas Project to you all several months ago uh, and in person in Mexico City. Uh, so we really can't ignore the fact that food donation operations play an ever more important role in times of crisis, such as this, uh, with demands at food banks surging globally. So in consultation with GFN and with support of Walmart Foundation, we decided to develop a solutions-oriented issue brief uh, that would break down the impacts of the pandemic on food donation and introduce strategies for more effective partnerships between donation operations and governments around the world. Uh, and just a little bit of background. Um, you know, it's, it's 
truly undeniable that the pandemic has had a devastating impact on global food systems and on the health and well being of communities around the world. This is especially true for those who were already marginalized and struggling to put food on the table. Reports from the last few months have projected an alarming spike in hunger and food insecurity. Uh, the FAO has warned of a looming food crisis in conjunction with this public health crisis, um, and estimates are suggesting that the number of chronically hungry people may double to more than 1.6 billion by the year's end. And at the same time, we know that food waste is accumulating along the supply chain with new pressure points on retail food outlets. So recognizing that food banks are so vital for mitigating food loss and waste, as well as hunger, especially in times of emergency, we wanted this issue brief to expose the true impacts of the pandemic on food donation operations worldwide. We also wanted to enumerate best practices for governments to ensure that policies adopted during COVID-19 are effectively enhancing rather than undermining food donation operations. Not only do we believe that government partnerships with food banks are smart solutions, but we also recognize that governments have an obligation to guarantee unrestricted access to food for all people, regardless of whether or not there's an ongoing food emergency. Now to answer these questions, uh, featured on the slide and enable us to make informed recommendations to policymakers. Uh, we turn to GFN, uh, who conducted a set of surveys in May and April of this year. Um, and these surveys were conducted of GFN member and affiliate organizations. Along with other data collected, we were able to identify several trends, uh, issues or considerations as they're referred to in the brief, uh, as well as best practices. And I'll introduce each briefly in turn. Uh, so the first issue we identified is that many countries do not officially recognize food banks and food recovery organizations um, and thus exclude these operations as part of emergency response measures. Few countries actually include food banks in national law or provide a platform or mechanism through which these private nonprofit organizations may influence policymaking. The GFA surveys revealed that even when food banks report a clear method or direct line of communication with government. Um, as the slide indicates, just over half were actually invited to meaningfully engage in government response efforts. So this exclusion from legal framework suggests that there's actually an issue of awareness. Governments are either not familiar with operations or don't realize their potential socioeconomic and environmental value. Uh, it makes it more difficult for governments to ultimately deploy food banks as an essential safety net um, or to deliver funding support to these organizations, as I'll discuss a little bit later. So a best practice here is to formally recognize these organizations as essential components of government response to food security. Uh, we see an example of this in the United States where food banks are routinely incorporated as part of official disaster response and emergency preparedness. Uh, under national law, food banks are recognized in the context of liability protection, that's the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. <clears throat> they receive annual allocations of food from federal government under the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAB. Um, and under the US tax code, as Emily mentioned, food donations made to these eligible organizations may actually qualify for an enhanced deduction. Similarly, in Israel and Argentina, uh, the use of national legislation affording liability protection to food donation has given these operations greater visibility and recognition during the pandemic. Uh, Peru has also adopted regulations for a 2016 law that facilitates food donation, including in times of natural disasters and emergencies. And having these laws in place before a pandemic may better position food banks in these countries to assist government response. Now, even when these frameworks exist, uh, it's important that governments articulate strategies for engaging with and deploying food banks as part of COVID response. Uh, but certainly featuring these operations in national legal frameworks makes this articulation more likely. So the second consideration we identified is that food banks and food recovery organizations are independently filling the gaps left by social protection programs. This is something that Doug alluded to in his opening remarks. 
Even before COVID-19, the International Labor Organization estimated that more than half of the population lacked comprehensive social protection coverage. As the pandemic has severely interrupted employment, uh, some countries have expanded social protections, even providing direct cash payments, uh, but still more than half a billion additional people could be facing poverty. So consistent with this reality, food banks around the world have reported a surge in demand, uh, with more than a third reporting twice as many beneficiaries as before the pandemic. Now for our best practice, we decided to focus on government social assistance for children, uh, as this population has been particularly affected by pandemic related school closures. Free and reduced price meals offered at schools are recognized uh, as an essential social safety net because it breaks intergenerational uh, cycles of poverty, removes barriers to education, uh, and this is especially true for girls, low income and rural children. Uh, now, as I've noted, uh, just under 200 countries introduced some form of school closure during the pandemic, whether it be national or localized. Um, and some governments, about 73 according to our research, were responsive in finding alternative methods of school meal recovery. Uh, however, deploying food banks and food recovery organizations to assist with the distribution can help expand the reach of these programs. In Canada, for example, governments have effectively partnered with food banks to establish distribution points and package meals to go. So next, we wanted to draw attention to the severe research shortage that food banks around the world are facing, uh, all while encountering an increased demand for food. Now, ordinarily, food banks rely on private donors or funding sources to support operations, and this may include the cost of operate of uh, transportation, volunteers, salary, benefits for staff, and some governments like in Brazil have developed procurement programs to provide food banks with locally sourced products and support the country's rural producers. Now, since the outbreak of COVID-19, food banks are reporting major shortages in funding, uh, with 85% reporting an urgent need uh, of funds just to continue their operations. Volunteer shortages um, have also resulted from social distancing measures, lockdowns, and volunteers tend to be older populations who may be at greater risk of contracting the virus. Um, food shortages have also been reported, as you can see from this slide, and this is not a result of not enough food being produced around the world, uh, but it's rather a reflection of the supply chain disruptions that we're seeing, um, such as interruptions in imports. Now, best practice here is for governments to allocate additional resources to support food banks during this period of increased demand. Uh, this support can come in the form of direct funding as is seen in Canada and the United States. Um, the US has also offered additional support for procurement through TFAB, which I mentioned earlier. Several countries, China, India, and Ghana, have also started to support the creation of food boxes uh, for distribution of food banks. And this is a collaboration with commercial supply chain producers who may have lost other methods of sale during the pandemic. Now, governments can also use policy to provide indirect support for food donation operations through incentives. Uh, one of the US COVID response laws, for example, offers an additional tax relief for donors. It's a pretty modest adjustment, but it's enough to signal to private donors that food banks are worthy investments. So finally, um, reports around the, uh, from the ground uh, confirm that the measures adopted by governments to reduce the spread of the virus, such as social distancing, shelter in place, and other restrictions on mobility, have adversely impacted food recovery operations. Um, you can see on this slide the responses from surveyed food banks confirming that the impacts are, are simply making daily operations more difficult, if not impossible. The survey respondents explained that volunteers and staff may be unable or not allowed to access premises of a food bank. Beneficiary organizations may find themselves with a limited window of time in which to collect donated food or may be prohibited from doing so altogether. Um, organizations that rely on on-farm rescue in rural areas also may be unable to continue their operations. Uh, and this is just gonna lead to greater food waste and greater food insecurity. 
So a best practice in light of these issues is really to carve out exemptions that explicitly permit food donation operations to continue their activities during the pandemic. This relates back to the initial consideration I discussed regarding the formal recognition of operations. Acknowledging these organizations as essential operations in law and policy will pave the way for these necessary exemptions. We've seen this happen in some LATAM countries, such as Argentina and Bolivia, uh, where the government has expressly permitted food bank networks to continue operating despite restrictions on mobility. We really encourage governments to consult with food bank networks and other food recovery organizations to develop creative strategies for continued operation. We also suggest that government investment and support uh, of innovative food recovery models that may rely less on warehouses or facilities where people gather. In conclusion, we found that many governments are not adequately recognizing the potential value of food donation operations as solutions to hunger and food loss and waste, um, and that they're not sufficiently including these organizations as part of the COVID-19 emergency response. So our brief recommends that, especially as this pandemic continues, governments recognize food donation operations as essential humanitarian relief organizations and social safety nets. And this really is both a recognition that needs to be afforded during the pandemic and beyond. So for more information about the issues and the best practices that I've discussed, I would invite you all to read the brief in full, which is accessible on our Atlas website. And thank you all for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Emily. We have a wealth of information um, in front of us and uh, experts in this field of food donation and recovery policy and law. I know there's a lot of questions, and I want to encourage uh, all attendees to submit a question to the speakers by typing your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can. And I'm going to begin with a question to either one of you, and that is from, the, from Europe. And the question is, is there any form of analysis or scope, potential, or impact of the policies that currently exist? and how those policies are relative to food surplus and food recovery reduction. What, we, what was really needed is the business case that demonstrates that if law X were enacted or policy Y changed, we could expect to see this kind of behavior in preventing food loss or waste or more food recovered. That's either one of you. I'll start and Melissa, of course, feel free to jump in. Um, I think I, I share the, the, the interest in, you know, seeing more of an analysis of the kind of, I would say, the cost benefit of different policies. From our experience, there's not something that really does this comprehensively. And I will say as lawyers, it's beyond our expertise to be able on our own to do this. But um, one resource we use a lot in the U.S. has been a group called ReFed. Um, so we've worked with them on a lot of the tracking of state policies around the U.S. They are interested as well in tracking the economic um, impact of some of the policies, but for now what they have done is uh, looked at some of the different solutions and they've tagged them to how much waste reduction they could expect. So as one example for the U.S., they, they say that if we standardize date labeling rules in the U.S., we can expect 398,000 tons of reduction in um, GHG, or in, in food waste, sorry. And then they tie those also to climate impact. So that's one place that we've gone. It's US specific. Um, I actually would be curious for those of you who are on the call, if there are resources like that that you want to send our way. Um, one of the great things with the website is that we're hoping people will use those boxes on the contact page and send us other resources that we can link to, to make the web page also be a hub for some of the other guides or things out there. And also acknowledging that we'll only be for now, hopefully it will continue, uh, but for now only looking at 15 countries. So if there are good resources beyond those that you want to share, we'd be happy to make it a place that people can go to find that as well. Melissa, anything you want to add? 
Yeah, I'll just add that I think that that's a really important um, aspect of kind of what we're trying to achieve with this project. So I think one part of the conversation does need to be focusing on, you know, what are the anticipated kind of quantitative impacts. Um, and what we're trying to dig into is the political feasibility. So if you find a policy that is going to have, you know, a measurable improvement in issues of, you know, preventing food loss and waste, but it's simply not politically feasible because the institutions or structures are not in place, it's not going to succeed. So I think we really do need both parts of the conversation. Excellent. Okay, we have another question from Europe, and this one is, has there been a challenge to food donation liability law, or is it simply used to facilitate um, uh, greater food donation from corporations that might otherwise be concerned with the risk? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so the, the law that's been on the books the longest with regard to liability protection is the U.S. Good Samaritan uh, Emerson Act. Um, so that's been in place for more than 20 years. And um, we have one of the uh, key leaders of the effort, it, um, Doug, was involved in actually the drafting of the Emerson Act. Um, so uh, there's actually been no legal challenge to the act, which is both really good and has some downsides. On the positive side, it's really great evidence that most you know, organizations and individuals who are receiving food are very grateful to receive that food. And even if there is a mishap, they're, they're not coming to court to file a suit about that. Um, so this should provide a lot of comfort to businesses here in the US where the protection exists, but also globally that this isn't really an area that's, that's litigated. On the flip side, one of the challenges with the fact that there hasn't been a legal case about this is that businesses look at it and say, well, how would a court use this protection? And so and I, I can say, as a lawyer, I understand that qualm that you know, no one wants to be the test case, no one wants to be the first one. Um, but I think what I would say is that the law is really intended to give quite comprehensive protection. I think the businesses should feel that it does. A kind of a related question, this is to either one of you, is that um, as you review the first five countries, um, has there been any, uh, this comes from Asia, has there been any unintended consequences of laws or policies meant to encourage food donation or food recovery? Mm. I don't know, Melissa, if anything jumps to mind for you. I mean, I'll, I'll give one example that we've seen, and this has been something we've seen for a while in the U.S., and I think we brought to our research, which is um, sometimes we find that laws, even the Emerson Act, for example, is a great and comprehensive protection but over time, it's now been 20 years, we're seeing that there are more innovative and new models of food recovery that weren't part of the, the dialogue at that time. And so we've been pushing for some minor updates to that. And again, it's, it's really comprehensive protection. But um, as one example, this is also relevant during COVID, the, the US liability protection only protects food that's donated and given to the end recipients for free. But um, there are some models that say, well, what if we want to sell in a, in a nonprofit grocery store or charge a delivery fee during COVID-19 to bring that food to people's homes um, so that they don't have to be waiting in long lines at a food pantry or um, some other agency. Um, but right now you wouldn't receive that protection if any amount of money is charged to the end recipient. So I think we do see things like that where um, nothing jumps to mind where there's been any really negative consequence, but it may enshrine one type of food donation. And over time, you need to revisit those laws in order to make sure that they're allowing for real innovation, new creative things. I mean, I was amazed by some of the partners we met through this year and at, and at FBLI last year, some of the really creative use of technology and apps and, and different innovative methods. And I think that those are the kinds of things where over time, uh, you know, we need to kind of continue working with the business sector, the nonprofit sector, and government hand in hand to not be stagnant in what we're, what we're, you know, what types of donation we're, we're allowing to take place. What's well, anything you want to add? Yeah, I would just add also, I, I don't think any unintended consequences come to mind, but I do think sometimes, you know, th there are policy makers and amazing organizations on the ground in these countries that do recognize the value of food donation and are working towards solutions. But I think sometimes there is a, a situation where something is being perceived as a silver bullet, it's implemented, and then there are still kind of remaining issues that need to be troubleshooted. Um, so I think that that's probably something more of what we're seeing is that like a really great first step has been taken, but 
is. It's just a first step. Mm -hmm. So in many countries in the GFN network, we are still in the throes of COVID response. Um, uh, nowhere near recovery just yet. And so we have quite a few questions related to, to COVID response. One is from uh, an academic, actually, and um, it's to you, Melissa. It is, you know, you alluded to innovative models, kind of what you're just speaking about, um, for food distribution um, and food banking in this, in this emergency. Could you elaborate on some of those models that have come across and, and, and how food donation recovery policies can help uh, encourage that behavior? Sure. So I think what immediately comes to mind in that respect is um, kind of this, this traditional notion that a food banking needs to involve some sort of warehouse or physical facility or space. Um, and I think what we found from some of our country visits is that that isn't always the case. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking more actually of kind of some of our year two LATAM countries in Colombia and Peru. Um, but there tends to be um, kind of this, this realization that to actually kind of prevent food loss and waste, especially in the more rural areas where food insecurity is most prevalent, it doesn't always make sense to uh, recover food from those locations, bring it back to an urban center for distribution and sorting, and then kind of redistribute it back to beneficiaries who are in those areas. So we're seeing a lot more, I think, innovation when it comes to being, pro being proactive and on-farm food recovery, and then kind of a redistribution in those rural areas where the food is actually being recovered. And adding, adding on to that, I think we saw an, uh, you know, examples of using different apps or technology that may connect, um, you know, kind of along the same lines, the uh, farm or food business to a driver, to the end recipient. And um, I, 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 those were starting to be more prevalent prior to COVID-19, but I think in many of the countries and here in the U.S. as well, we've seen huge growth in those models because there's just more food available in places where it wasn't before. So even if there were relationships with, you know, a business that typically had a lot of food, the, the places where the waste is occurring have changed really rapidly. So uh, it seems like some of these technology models that are able to find and make those connections more quickly are um, getting a lot more play. So I, I'm delighted that we are getting questions literally from every global region, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia Pacific, LATAM, um, Europe, all, all around. Um, so I'm going to try and get to as many of these as I can. One that's come up, which I think is interesting, is that is the question is about food tax incentives. Um, and I think that the, the question here is, is that um, when countries allow tax deductions, um, are, there, are there incidents of abuse of that law that might, um, might lead countries to either restrict those, those food de uh, deduction uh, opportunities or otherwise prevent abuse that might actually have an unintended consequence of further restricting food donations. Can you guys speak to any of that, either from your research now or, or what you've uh, uncovered elsewhere? Um, I have not heard of any case of there being abuse of the tax deduction. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but in the countries we've researched up till now, plus the ones we've already looked at for the next year, it, there hasn't been a single case that we've heard of for that. I mean, I think if anything we hear where uh, the country has created a tax incentive but it's not working properly. So I think I mentioned maybe briefly one example um, in, in Canada, there is a tax incentive, but businesses, in order to claim that incentive, they first need to add the value of the food as their inventory cost before they claim the exact same value. So it ends up being completely nullified and businesses can't actually um, obtain that incentive. Say in the US where we do have a quite a strong incentive, we've heard a lot of challenges like the, the way that you quantify the value of the food for that deduction is somewhat complicated. So for uh, farms, for businesses that have a lot of different types of foods, it becomes um, kind of costly endeavor just to figure out the correct amount to claim. But we have not heard of cases where there's been um, an issue with the, with the uh, abuse of that. I think another best practice is that in most cases, the um, food donor is required to get some statement or some proof, some confirmation from the nonprofit organization showing that they did donate food and what the value of that is. So having a couple different players involved in that, it helps to, to mitigate against any risk of abuse. I don't know, Melissa, if you want to add or if there's any 
neg other kind of negative examples that you could think of? No, and I think in fact we hear more that that the process to claim the benefit is so onerous and sometimes time consuming and costly that it actually doesn't even feel like an incentive or benefit uh, to the corporate partners. Right. So that actually is a, is a good segue to um, quite a few questions on the same issue, uh, both from sub-Saharan Africa and from Asia, which is in the research, you know, and especially in this COVID-19 environment um, that, that many of us still experience, um, is that did you come across noteworthy approaches on how food banks have effectively advocated for these changes and, um, and how they can better engage government in changing legal frameworks to support food recovery and, and thereby extend social protection? I, I mentioned a few throughout. I mean, I've been blown away at the success and, you know, as to some extent, GFN is curating our experience by helping us point us to the strong uh, you know, some of the countries where there's strong partners that have been really involved in some of the, the policy change. But I think, you know, I mentioned in India, the surplus food regulations was really an endeavor pushed and, and led. And um, there was the creation of the Indian Food Sharing Alliance, which are um, Tomato Feeding India, India Food Banking Network, et cetera, working together in partnership with government to create that regulation. In Argentina, Lored was very involved in the effort to get the um, liability protection added to the Food Donation Act there, as well as efforts to try to change the tax benefit to strengthen it, although still ongoing efforts there. So I think, um, you know, there are really good examples of this that we've seen. I don't want to speak for those partners because I think it's taken a lot of work and um, sometimes years of advocacy and coalition building to do that. but. Um, we have seen that it is possible, and I think um, our hope is really with our resources to provide a roadmap for countries as to, you know, if you wanted to now in your country try to get a liability protection law, starting to be able to see what other countries have these, where can I go, how can I find the information, which countries might be really strong models and might be persuasive to my government. Um, but I wanted to add something that I want to not forget, which is, we are really open to hear feedback as well if there are ways that we can present the information in more useful ways or additional resources or one pages or things that that are particularly of interest and i hope that um, those attending today will you know i think feel free to add comments through the website function or reach out to gfn um, not to put you on the hook but just if there's we've now accumulated so much information and our goal is really to as we continue to add on to that, also make sure that it's really actionable by all of you in your unique situations. Okay. All right. Um, so another question we have is uh, related to, again, COVID, is that um, with limited funding um, uh, the governments have, um, are there concerns in the COVID response that there might be donor fatigue with certain policies? Or do you see the, the COVID recommendations carrying through in a recovery phase that actually strengthen overall food recovery efforts? I, mean, I think I'll maybe take the first part of that question and then Emily, if you wanna take the second. But I, I just, one thing that immediately strikes me is uh, this is exactly why, while we are focusing on COVID-19 in this brief, the, the scope of the Atlas project is much bigger. And I think that's, something that's really important to keep in mind um, because what we are seeing is absolutely a situation that's you know potentially at risk of, of featuring donor fatigue um, in the United States in particular there has been a tremendous amount of funds uh, now allocated and designated to uh, food bank operations there's been amazing you know kind of multi-sectoral support I think for these operations um, which I think is is great for the time being but I think we need to recognize that these operations require more sustainable um, kind of support and partnerships with governments and so that's really what we're trying to do, I think, with the Atlas project as a whole is say, you know, yes, we happen to right now be an emergency situation where governments are kind of forced to realize we need these operations to, to kind of stop the bleed. But the reality is that food donation operations under normal circumstances are critical to uh, kind of filling the gaps of social protection and bolstering government 
uh, food assistance response. Um, and so having just more sustainable, I think, funding solutions, uh, greater representation in legal frameworks is really what we're going for. Good, and that, that's an excellent segue, I think, towards our, our last question. Um, I have quite a few that have come in asking about, uh, I didn't see my country on the map. Um, <laughs> and as, at the outset, there was, uh, you mentioned, Emily, that there are 15 countries in this project thus far. Um, and I want to say that a core value of GFN's model is to share information across borders. So where there are good ideas, we want to make sure that the person in one country can share it with the person in another country and replicate that. Um, can you speak a little bit about the future uh, of the project in the coming year? And before you do, um, this is meaningful, uh, we have a comment as well from Lat Am that says, congratulations to Emily and Melissa for the wonderful wonderful work you've done. It will impact positively the life of many people around the world. And so as you think about the next stage of this project, I hope that's at the front and center. And if you want to speak a little bit about um, going forward. Well, first of all, thank you to whoever wrote that comment. I mean, I, I kind of said at the beginning, but I want to reiterate that it's been an absolute joy for us working on this project. It's been a lot of work. We've learned a lot. Um, I hope we'll be you know, more seamless as we go forward. But I think I can't say enough about how much I've learned from all of our partners and, you know, the, the um, just inspiration that I've derived from seeing what the work is looking like on the ground. Um, and I hope that, you know, we have our work cut out for us the next year in doing the research on these next 10 countries and getting that out to all of you. Um, I hope we'll continue after that. Um, we would love your help in making the case for that and, and um, to us and to GFN and helping um, tell, you know, our partners at Walmart Foundation and other supporters. Um, but it is certainly something that I hope we'll be able to continue. And then, as I, as I said before, to reiterate that if there are things we can do that would be really helpful for countries that are not part of this project, we'd love to know that and we'll find ways to either fold that into future proposals or to the extent we can you know, package the information we have in ways that would be more useful, we definitely want to be able to do that because the idea of looking at the first 15 countries wasn't to only help 15 countries, it was to learn some things that, you know, by bringing in countries from different parts of the globe and um, kind of learn the best practices and the, where the rubber meets the road. So um, I, my hope is that we'll be doing this for some time to come. And that, that's GFN's hope as well. Um, we we want to have this so that um, pretty much all the food banks in our network and hopefully beyond will be included in the project after the second year. I want to thank um, Emily and Melissa for the time. Um, there's many, many more questions. And so I want to encourage those that we weren't able to get to. You can either uh, offer those questions on the Atlas website. Um, that I believe Tony has made available on the screen previously, uh, or you can simply send an email to info at foodbanking.org, and we'll try and respond to those as quickly as possible. I want to thank you all, and I want to now hand it over to Lisa Moon. Thank you, Doug. Um, and I just want to also express my appreciation to Emily and Melissa for a fantastic first session of virtual FBLI and to everyone who were, was able to join us today for your engagement um, and for asking your questions. Please do reach out to us and we will make sure we get you an answer. Um, at this moment, I want to thank our event sponsors, including General Mills, HEB, Brambles, Cargill, the DLA Piper Foundation, Pandossi and Lala, and Ingridion. Um, they had all joined us uh, for the event in Mexico and have generously agreed to extend their support to make this six-month virtual series possible. Um, so a video recording of today's session and the speaker's presentations is going to be available on our virtual site later today. So please feel free to share the link with anyone in your network who might find this conversation useful. Um, we will have details out to you on the next plenary session, um, which will be scheduled in a few weeks' time, and we're really hoping to continue the conversation in various time zones over the course of the next couple of months. Thank you again for participating and we look forward to talking with you all soon.